Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to welcome our final speaker, who is representing our headline sponsor for today. Um, it takes a lot to organise a day like this in a venue like this, um, and we can't do it without our sponsors, our exhibitors, and indeed you, our delegates, um, so thank you very much. Um, John's going to be discussing the positive outcomes working um, in the education sector, and in particular, um, how they're making uh, the case for sport for development. So ladies and gentlemen, Chief Executive of Greenhouse Sports, John Herriman. Uh, right, thank you, uh, Yvonne, um, and we're delighted as Greenhouse Sports to be the headline sponsor for today. Now, one of the things I didn't realise uh, was that being a headline sponsor actually meant to say that we got our own branding on the coffee cups that you've all been using. Um, so, uh, as a chief executive of a charity, I'm now actually working out how many uses I can get out of a paper cup, paper cup at this particular point. Um, what I also hadn't realised um, was uh, actually how bad I was and what it was like to do that in front of an audience with the head, shoulders, knees and toes, actually. Uh, so I'm going to go back home and practice with my three-year-old daughter, who's far better at that than I am, I can sort of say at this stage. Um, and also, as you just heard, actually, uh, I'm now standing between you and the coffee break, and there is no more dangerous place to be after an early start um, on a uh, Thursday morning, uh, so I'd better get started on the presentation. Now, one of the things I should also say at this particular point, uh, can I just say to the team at the back, can you turn the lights up? Uh, there are two reasons for that. One is because you're going to be using the technology, uh, and the second is because if you don't, then I can't read my notes. <laughs> there we go, as if by magic. Um, so, listening to the other speakers this morning, um, what strikes me is the, I think, the collective passion uh, to make the case for the positive impact of sport. And that's exactly the reason that we're here uh, as Greenhouse Sports, because we share that passion. And I'm consciously aware, probably, that many of you in this room have never, ever heard of who Greenhouse Sports uh, actually are. Um, and that's another reason for us to be here, because if you don't know about us, you don't know where we are, uh, then you can't talk to us and we can't talk to you. Um, and we're very keen to collaborate with everybody to help make that what we think is a fairly elusive case uh, for sport for development. Um, so maybe uh, just talk about who we are um, a little bit, um, because our belief at Greenhouse Sports is it's not the lack of ability, but a lack of opportunity uh, that impacts on the life chances of young people, including their subsequent employability. And as a community sports charity, um, it's something we've been committed to challenging for the last 15 years, supporting during that time over 40,000 young people from some of London's most disadvantaged neighbourhoods, and we only work in London. And what we've got is an unstinting belief in the power of sports to help make a difference to these young people because we believe that it helps develop those key characteristics that you've heard about, often summed up as resilience or grit, um, that actually help prepare young people for life. And we do that by providing over 50 extracurricular sports programmes uh, working in partnership with schools across London. And that's delivered by some exceptional coaches who amaze me and inspire me on a daily basis because they create that balance between fun and challenge um, in those sort of settings that really help those young people to develop. And it's something that I can identify with because I had that sort of environment, not within the education setting, but particularly in the armed forces where I spent a lot of my time, which is where you get that fun, that challenge and that development, which I think really helps to develop a person at whatever age it is. Actually, we just focus on young people. Now, let's just, first of all, think about what impact is and what's it really about, because it's actually about young people like Nathan, who's pictured here. Um, now, Nathan joined one of our programmes a number of years ago as a wayward 11-year-old. His home life was fairly challenging. He was in trouble both in and out of school, and he was actually on the cusp of exclusion. His life chances weren't good anyway, one might say, and actually, they were just about to get worse. Now, Nathan, who I had the real privilege of meeting for the first time the other day, is exactly the reason that we do at Greenhouse Sports what we do, um, because we want to give those who may have been dealt that sort of poor hand in life the opportunities that we think they really deserve. And that's what impact really is when you get down to it. It's those life-changing interventions that we all do here, all of us in this room, that help people like Nathan and convincing others that sporting in interventions should be invested in. Now, our passion, and it really is a passion as a charity, is to create opportunities through sports 
to transform young people's lives. And like everybody here, we all need to know if our programmes are actually working. And we've recently been on our, on our own sort of very personal impact journey where we were forced to ask ourselves some pretty tough questions because we needed to know if our programmes were really having the impact we believe they were, helping young people like Nathan. Um, and this is a key point because whilst we believed we were making a difference and we had some great case studies, we were still struggling to recruit new schools into our programmes, who I should say at this point pay two-thirds of the programme cost, so they have some skin in the game. And they therefore need to know that what they're buying effectively is high quality, good value for money, and actually delivering outcomes that are relevant to them. And talking with schools as we went round, many of whom were equally passionate about sports in terms of head teachers and teachers, I should say, when it came to the funding crunch, because they're focused on other areas that Ali has talked about, they had to justify their expenditure and they were struggling to do that. They therefore couldn't just do it because they liked doing it. A sign of straightened times maybe, but actually it's a reality of where we find ourselves right now. And I think this is one of my key messages because whilst we were very good at stating the emotive case for the value of what we do, we hadn't fully made the case with hard evidence. What we hadn't done was to link what we deliver, the bit that we're passionate about, with the outcomes in their specific context, the bit they needed to see. In other words, educational outcomes, in other words. And when we reflected further, we thought this might be representative of some of the wider challenges that we as a sector uh, f have faced, proving what we do. And as far back as 2007, uh, the respected sports academic Fred Coulter highlighted this as a problem when he said there were lots of ill-defined interventions with hard to follow outcomes. And maybe we should ask how far we've really come since then. And that's exactly what we're going to do right now, because you've got the technology. Uh, so if you want to grab the technology, and then there will be a question, hopefully, coming up on the screen. And this is the point where I get put on the spot and thinking on my feet to see what responses you give back. So who thinks, as a sector, we've made the case for sport for development? I'm not sure how long they're giving you, but uh, hopefully fairly soon. Ooh. <laughs> now, I don't want to get political at this point, but this is very close to the referendum we had a lot of while ago. Now, that's very, very interesting. Now, um, I don't want <laughs> Um, now, I actually completely missed the results then in terms of which one was which, but I either, go, I either agree with the 51% or the 49%, um, because I agree actually with the 49% uh, that actually we haven't fully made that case at this particular point. Um, and I'd say that because I think if we had made that case, um, then actually we'd see a lot more commissioning of sport for wider social outcomes. And I say that because we thought we were further along that journey as greenhouse sports than we really were, and it was our own shortcomings that actually led us to the realisation that there was probably some work to do. The issue, we might argue, is that we've actually done a lot to state the case for sport for development, but we've actually seemingly done less so to actually make that case. So what we've actually done is that we've talked about it a lot, the case intuitively makes sense, produced lots of reports saying lots of things we all agree with, but we as a sector still struggle with why others, especially policymakers and funders, don't get it. And it is, I think you'll probably all agree, intensely frustrating. And don't get me wrong, I think we've articulated the rationale for sport for development, the impact it could have, the gap that exists that it could fill, and these are important steps, but there is one final hurdle in our mind to prove that you can fill that gap. And to fill that gap, we would argue that you need high quality evidence of impact to get people to part with public money or actually private money uh, for that matter. And I think it's entirely justifiable for funders to want to see that evidence and the onus is therefore on us to make sure that we provide that evidence. And yes, the funding context may well have got a little bit tougher, which means funders therefore may be slightly more demanding with more evidence. But that's actually not a bad thing when you think about it because evidence critically improves delivery, which takes us back to Nathan. Now, Nathan, when he comes up on the screen, there we go, uh, was actually at risk of exclusion. Um, 
and he was actually just about to be excluded. This is Nathan on the right-hand side. He'd actually just assaulted a fellow pupil in his school. So our coach, Coach uh, Predrag, who you'll see, uh, or you saw, who you saw earlier, was brought into the discussion and convinced the school that they could use our intensive coaching and mentoring programmes. We say our sports coaches are 49% sports coach and 51% mentor to help him get back on track through basketball. Now, focusing on sport as a vehicle to engage Nathan, the coach gradually built up his confidence so that he was able to control his behaviours, not just in the sports hall, but in the classroom and in the corridors as well, and then in his wider social environment. And because of this, he was able to re-engage with the education system as well as becoming good at sport. In fact, he became very, very good at sport. Now, my background is in education. I've previously worked at the National Association of Head Teachers. And as somebody coming in from outside the sports sector, I form formed a view, rightly or wrongly, that we as a sector may have made lots of claims about the value of sport, most of which I also believe in as somebody who's played a lot of sport during my life and also benef benefited from it. But we've importantly moved on from the narrow competitive elite frame of reference, whose case has been made that term sport for development, a term I must admit I struggle with sometimes in terms of actually what it means. We presented lots of studies but have not been able to show the real evidence to commissioners. It might be a contentious point but once we've done well collecting lots of important general evidence we might just have used this to talk a good game. For me, one of the possible reasons for this is because we've been too prescriptive in some of the frameworks and outcomes telling us what sport for de development is, and we might have taken this too much at face value, believed it ourselves because we're so passionate about it, and because we see and feel the results of what we do on a daily basis. We know it's true, in other words. But others don't, because they don't get it in the way that we do. And in reality, you need to support this view with high quality research in specific contexts in terms of our view, not just general reports and studies. And it will be the outcomes of any research that define that greater whole. We all then complete our little piece of the jigsaw with our own high quality research and share it widely. And that's how we're then able to make the case together. And let's also not forget, we're trying to change a traditional perception of sport as purely competitive, which has been ingrained for generations. And the number of ill-informed people who still think that's what sport is, is actually alarmingly high. But probably you, like me, I thoroughly enjoy those opportunities and I get to actually re-educate them along the way. I think another possible reason is because we haven't necessarily fully engaged in evidence-based practice. In fact, we can't have, or the case would have been made, going back to an earlier point. And this, I think, is where cross-sector learning can be particularly valuable. And the education sector is all about evidence-based practice. And this was, again, the impetus for our change in approach. We needed to present high-quality evidence to schools about the value of our coaching and mentoring programmes, and we weren't doing it. That was our reflection. So it's hardly surprising that they weren't flocking to sign us up with new schools. I should say, though, that sport in schools, as you've sort of heard, isn't all rosy. It suffered badly over recent years, as a report from the all-party parliamentary group on a fit and healthy childhood has clearly articulated, partly, I think, because it hasn't provided enough evidence for its benefits to wider educational outcomes. A point I think we're in complete agreement about with the Youth Sports Trust and also Greater Sport, um, about the wider benefits of sports on social, emotional and behavioural development. In other words, it's about the whole child. And I must admit, at this point, I personally struggle with school strategies to develop those current buzzwords around character and values that actually don't see sports as part of that solution, uh, which is what we sometimes see. And maybe that just sums up how bad it is. And actually, it also, for me, got a lot worse this morning when I saw that Birmingham University report, because I think you just must have to try really, really hard to get an intervention through sports that doesn't somehow manage to tackle obesity in people. You've, got to, you've actually got to make that not work, in my mind. So after our realisation, we thought long and hard about the approach to impact and looked to our coaches and how they approach problems. They develop young people by adopting a growth mindset. It's simple. If something isn't working, you don't just keep doing it. You actually find a different way to do it. And now let's also be clear that we did have some evidence in greenhouse sports, but we didn't have high-quality research evidence independently verified by a third party. 
So there was an opportunity for us to do it differently and to approach it differently. And I think that's exactly how this should be seen. It's that opportunity, and it was an opportunity for us, and maybe that's an opportunity for the wider sector, because if more of us can make that case in that way and show that value for money, high quality, and those proven outcomes, we can then become a better option for funders and commissioners. And the upside of that is that by making a stronger case, naturally more commissioning should follow, which means more people end up getting active. It's simple. So with funding from NHS England and a partnership with Loughborough University, we developed our new approach and focusing on internal evaluation across all our programmes conducted by our impact team and then some third party detailed validation to assess if we really delivered what we thought we delivered. If we did, then great, we keep everything as it was. If not, then we'd change it. Now I'm not going to focus here on the impact research that we conducted, oh, sorry, I'm only going to focus here on the impact research we conducted at a headline level. So uh, we're hoping that this is a bit of a teaser to get you to come into our workshop and see us a little bit later where we'd love to see you. Um, and also that'll be where Dr. Carolyn Mason, the lead researcher from Loughborough, uh, will ta talk far more eloquently about the research and the methodology uh, and why we were able to get the results that we did. And there'll also be an opportunity to hear our sports coaches talking about how they're using the research to, to help shape their best practice. Because there's an important point to reinforce at this point, which is that research is not an end in itself. Improving the programmes for young people like Nathan is. So where did the research end up? It took six months. It took lots of interviews with students, teachers, head teachers, and coaches for the qualitative assessment, and then a particularly painful piece of work, which was getting the data out of the schools. But we then had some preliminary results. But not content with one set of eyes, we then listed the help, because we like to be tough on ourselves at Greenhouse Sports, um, the help of pro bono economics to provide a peer review of the whole research. And that told us in the final report, and there's a copy of the final report in your delegate bags, I believe, that participants on Greenhouse Sports programmes um, attended on average eight days more school per year relative to their non-greenhouse peers, that there were improvements in both attainment and progress for that cohort, equivalents in some areas to one third of a grade, so effectively a school improvement initiative, and behaviours also improved, unsurprisingly, but we were able to prove it. And this was the research conclusion that you can all read. And whilst you're reading that, I will say one of the particularly satisfying aspects of the research was that uh, one of the researchers, not Caroline, who you'll see a bit later on, um, but the, uh, the lead researcher for the quantitative data actually did turn around to us at one point and said there, actually, there is absolutely no chance whatsoever that you're going to get any positive results out of this quantitative research. Um, and actually there was nothing more satisfying than we got the positive results. And uh, I also realised that appealing to my sort of slightly warped sense of humour, there is nothing more satisfying than watching an academic eating their hat at the point. <laughs> now, funnily enough, our results say nothing new that others haven't been saying should be the case. It's just that it hasn't been proven in the specific content we work in. And now we've not only just been able to state the case, but to make it albeit in a narrowly defined context in the education sector. And that's what the schools needed to help justify their expenditure. And we now have more schools wanting our programmes. So what next? Well, we've only done one piece of research, and I'm not going to overclaim the results, because it was just a scoping study with four secondary schools, albeit large secondary schools. And so we've proven that intensive sports coaching and mentoring programmes can and do have an impact. We've not categorically proven how and why this happens so that it can be replicated. We think we do know why, but as per my earlier point, that's not going to convince anybody that's not as close to sport as we are. And they're the people that we've got to reach out to. So we're therefore planning to look in more detail at the value of sports in developing skills for employability, particularly why we wanted to be here today. Because that's only really been proven to date for those who end up working directly in sports. It's hasn't shown how sports develops character and skills valuable for wider employment, not just going into sports. And surprisingly, there's actually very little focused research that proves this. And actually, there's a lot that says that case hasn't been made. And as recently as 2015, Sheffield Hallam said in relation to employability, there is limited evidence for the success of programmes in developing these skills. So I'm now going to turn to the technology for the uh, second and final time. So let's see if we get a referendum vote again. So who believes that uh, sports develops positive attributes that are useful to those seeking employment? We 
fascinated by the results. <laughs> Slightly more unequivocal. So that's just what I was expecting. So we all believe it does, but to my earlier point, the explicit link between sports and skills that employers want has not been made with high quality evidence. We believe it does, but we haven't proven it. So this is an area that we'd like to focus on this year, not just making the case for sports leading to employment within sports, but supporting wider careers. And again, we all know it's the case. We believe it's the case. We've probably all benefited, but there's nothing that funders can latch onto easily when looking at this. And I think we need to be content at this point that we are doing this partly because we do need to go after some funding. Uh, because if we research impact effectively, it will support further development and improvements in our delivery model as well, and also helps to uh, generate sort of more impact on young people. And for us, we believe this will enhance our reputation within the education sector because we want to create an impact system that's valuable to us for continuous improvement in delivery and for schools and funders to see the rigour in what we do connected to clear outcomes that we can evidence. It therefore becomes mutually reinforcing at that point. And we're very keen to collaborate. That's why we're here. We'd love for you to come and talk to us. We'd love to talk to you and just to be able to share some of that best practice. Um, and today is not, for us, it's not a call to action, because I suspect there's been far too many of those over the years. It's actually more of a plea for help, because we need your best practice and your views on this. And we found that partnering with schools is the best way to work, and we also believe that partnership more generally is the best way to work, and we therefore want to work with you and the wider sector. Although, funny enough, I don't think that we're actually good at it as somebody coming into the sports sector, which is probably surprising for those of us that are involved in team sports, but maybe it's that competitive streak that gets in the way and maybe we just like quick, unanimous results. Impact and evidence, however, is a long game. So my hope is that we can see this as a, a huge opportunity for the sector, not least with the new approach from Sports for Development Coalition and also Sport England's new strategy. And it would all be, or it'd be nice if we could all get behind those so they become the catalyst to drive that high quality impact research in our own specific areas. Because we can do that and work collaboratively around those frameworks, I do believe that we can make that very strong case for sport, for development, or whatever we call it. We all know it works, and we all want to see it much more deeply ingrained into everyone's everyday lives and at every stage of their lives. So let me just now return finally to Nathan. So Nathan is somebody we are hugely proud of at Greenhouse Sports. He not only excelled at basketball, but he did well in his academics. In fact, so well that he ended up getting a scholarship to Allegheny College in the United States. And he finishes his degree later this year and is looking to return to the United Kingdom. And I just know that he's going to excel at whatever he does. All because his coach saw his true potential and worked hard to help him achieve it in partnership with the school. And yes, Nathan went through our programmes before we did our impact research in the way we've done it now, but I think that makes the point that if we'd had higher quality proof then, then we might have been able to help even more young people like Nathan than we have to date. And to do that, we need to convince more people that what we do is life-changing so we can help other Nathans who are not being given that opportunity to fulfil their true potential. And that, for us at Greenhouse Sports, it really is a world that we dream of living in and one that we would love to see turn into a reality. So thank you.